bizarre television show, Game of Thrones Meets Management, features many different characters from the Game of Thrones television series. Our show explores the different management and leadership styles employed by each of our characters and how these skills and styles are used to earn the spot on the Iron Throne. Each of the characters have very distinguishable traits and values that embody what it means to work in an involving and globalized community. One example would be employing Daenerys Targaryen and Tyron Lannister discussing different negotiation techniques in order to try and gain a temporary alliance with the Queen of King's Landing, Tyron's sister, Cersei Lannister. Each one of these episodes are different in that each episode tells a different story. A set of different stories that will ultimately try to bring one of the characters into the ultimate managerial role, ruler of the Iron Throne, and manager of all the Seven Kingdoms. That is, if they can make it there alive. Our target audience is young adults and working class individuals 18 years and up. With interest in humor, gore, and intellectual and strategic decision-making tactics. The show is set in the imaginary continents of Essos and the Westeros. And our show plans to bring management concepts to the big screen with an action-packed storyline. By creating this television show, our viewers will follow each of our characters on their journey to the Iron Throne, observing different managerial techniques and leadership styles along the way. I am a global business major at USF St. Pete. I just recently transferred here this year for my junior year. I am a commuter student and I live in West Chase, Florida. I have a twin sister and my goal is to attend graduate school and earn an MBA with a concentration in finance. Eventually I want to move back to New York. I would love to live in the city for a couple of years and then move out to Long Island where my friends and family are. My contributions as the team leader for this Finger Puppet Management TV show include communicating with my group every day as to what needs to get done and how we are all going to plan and execute weekly tasks. I have been involved in task delegation and management, creating storyboards, working on my assigned characters and episodes, and uploading videos and group assignments to the course YouTube channel. Hi, I'm Jay. I moved to Florida in 2010 after spending eight years in the military at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, jumping from airplanes and fighting terrorism. I moved to Florida. I got my associate's degree from Pasco Hernando State College, and I currently manage a vascular surgery center. I am also a pre-hospital trauma life support instructor, a tactical operations and close quarters combat instructor, and a tactical paramedic. I enjoy skydiving and puppies. My goals are to graduate with my bachelor's degree in health sciences and to skydive from a hot air balloon over the beach with puppies strapped to my chest wearing tiny puppy parachutes and surfboard shoes so we have a smooth water landing. I am a marketing major in my junior year at USF. I enjoy playing sports, fishing, and hanging out with friends. I don't have any kids, and after I graduate, I plan on developing tiny parachutes for daredevil puppies who want to jump out of hot air balloons. I have been contributing to the video editing portions of our tasks despite my limited knowledge on the subject. I always try my best to help the team. He's a finance major who recently started at USF St. P and works full-time for a logistics company called Dedicated Global Carriers. He's passionate about family as well as sports and motivation. He tries to jump in when possible to help the team progress and has studied his characters in order to understand the managerial concepts they apply to our show. Nima is a business manager, is the one of the quieter people in the group. He's a GM of Chick-fil-A. He always offers to help when we need someone to do something. He has help with ideas of storyboards and the storyboards themselves. The mission of our team was to show managerial growth and concepts of this course by using the Game of Thrones television show. Daenerys Stormborn of the House Targaryen, first of her name, the unburnt queen of the Andals, and the first men, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, breaker of chains and mother of dragons, the true-born ruler and manager of the Iron Throne and the Seven Kingdoms. With too many managers trying to play the game of games and rise to the top, only one will survive and thrive. Watch as the battle between Daenerys Targaryen, Jon Snow, and Cersei Lannister plays out. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. 
This Game of Thrones is a challenge like no other. Tune in and watch the journey each manager will take to arrive at King's Landing, including their ability to lead different types of teams and conquer different battles and challenges. This battle of managers will take place in the Seven Kingdoms. Each general manager is fighting for the promotion to become the king or queen of the Seven Kingdoms. They will conquer land, gather troops, orchestrate meetings between team leaders, and establish their hand of the king or queen in order to delegate tasks. There will also be a code of ethics all competing managers must abide by. All of these will be important in the concepts focused on in this show. The goal is to examine each individual organizational structure created by each of their competitors. Our target audience will be young adults slash businessmen and women in their early to mid-twenties. Our viewers will be individuals just starting out in their careers, and this television show will captivate a younger audience because of the popularity with this storyline and the characters affiliated with this show. Also known as Khaleesi, Daenerys Targaryen is a strong leader and can lead large, diverse groups of individuals. She is an understanding leader. She values loyalty and friendship. She is supported by many because she is a queen who leads with her head and her heart. Khaleesi is the true-born ruler of the Iron Throne. She is the daughter of Ares Targaryen, the Mad King. She married the great Khat Drago, who gifted her a horse on her wedding day. She grew to love him despite this being arranged marriage. She lost her baby, and later her three dragon aids hatched when she walked into a fire. She was unharmed by the flames and became known as the Unburnt and Mother of Dragons. She conquered Slaver's Bay, which started her journey to building an army and marching on towards King's Landing and the Iron Throne. She meets many people along the way and encounters many challenges which shape her into the leader she is destined to be. She is a great problem solver and a fair queen to her people. Jon Snow, to the knowledge of only the viewers, is the bastard child of Ned Stark. However, in reality, he's the son of Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark. He lives at Castle Black with Ned Stark and Caitlin Stark, his two sisters and two brothers. He was sent to the Night's Watch, where he devoted his life to man the wall. Through his experiences of training to be, being a knight and his relationships with others, he later becomes commander of the Night's Watch. Jon is a man of the people, which makes him a great manager and leader. He learns quickly and climbs up in standing. After encountering certain characters and adventures and situations, he leaves. He steps down and leaves the Night Watch and reunites with his family at Castle Black. He later meets his sister, which he doesn't actually know is his sister, and, put, and he pledges his loyalty and declare her the rightful queen to the Iron Throne. Tyron Lannister is the dwarf brother of Cersei and Jaime Lannister. Tyron loves his brother, but his sister is another story. She hates him because Cersei and their father Tywin blame Tyron for the death of his beloved mother. She died giving birth to Tyron, of which is not his fault. Tyron is the loyal and true friend to many. He believes in serving those who have good intentions. He is smart, witty, and stealthy. He is the survivor and will serve as the hand of the Queen Khaleesi. He will join her army in the fight for the Iron Throne at King's Landing when the time comes. Cersei Lannister is the mother of King Joffrey and the daughter of Tywin Lannister. The Lannisters are known for their gold. She is an evil leader who only cares about herself and her family. She doesn't have any friends. She values loyalty from her people, and those who do not devote their existence to her family will pay with their life. She was married to Robert Bartheon. However, all of her children are to her brother, Jaime Lannister. Cersei has a temper like no other and kills many people both directly and indirectly throughout the show. She is irrational, headstrong, calculated, selfish, harsh, and powerful. Sansa Stark is a timid girl who grows into a strong woman. The events in her life shape her into the person she is at the end of the series. She is a good leader but struggles to gain the support of her people because they want a man to serve as their leader. Although she is the true queen of Castle Black, she stands behind Jon Snow, her half-brother. She trusts people too easily and follows her heart more than she should. This gets her into trouble along the way. Tommen is known for his innocence and kind-hearted nature despite his family's notorious reputation of being mean-spirited. The virtuous king contains qualities fit for ruling, such as being polite, humble, compassionate, and kind. 
Although he holds these valuable assets, which are typically important for being a quality leader, he's vulnerable to being easily influenced. Shortly after his brother's passing, he becomes king and victim to the seduction and manipulation of his brother's widow, Marjorie. He falls deeply in love with Marjorie and is absolutely crushed when she's killed. Once seeing the great sept of Baylor explode with Marjorie and her family inside, Tommen immediately removes his crown and calmly throws himself out of the window to commit suicide. Marjorie is quite possibly the most charming character in the show. Not only beautiful, she is driven and self-motivated as well as strong with a brilliant mind. Her greatest asset is her ability to win the minds and loyalties of her subjects and is completely loyal to the House of Tyrell. Using these tactical advantages, she is successful in gaining a significant role in leadership. She is in particularly effective with her tactics of manipulation, which is shown by marrying King Joffrey and became queen consort through their marriage. Once her husband is poisoned hours after their wedding ceremony, Marjorie moves her tactics towards his little brother and seduces Tommen, ultimately becoming his wife. However, her drive to become queen may have been her ultimate downfall, as she is possibly the greatest threat to Cersei, who has her and her family destroyed. <coughs> End episode. Mutiny at Castle Black. Jon Snow has been promoted as a new Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. His bravery and leadership led him to this promotion. He spent time with the Wildlings as part of the intelligent mission. He realized that both the Night's Watch and the Wildlings were both descendants of the First Men. Both had the right to reside wherever they wanted. Jon Snow thought they should allow the Wildlings to pass through the Wall and into the Seven Kingdoms. This would mean that they would have to face the White Walkers and the Night King. However, they later had to face the fight and fight the White Walkers. Jon Snow was unable to relay this message with the rest of his team, and they did not want to believe that the White Walkers were real. Most of these men had been brought up to believe that they were just made up stories of the terrors in the night. Jon's role was to direct his team, of which he failed to do. Directing is the process of attempting to influence other people to attain an organizational objective. Directing is very important because if the team isn't working towards a common goal, then you just have a group of individuals doing their own thing. John went ahead and did it anyway because he thought that was the right thing to do at the time. The majority of the Knights Watch did not agree with his decisions because they did not like the Wildlings. They, they planned a mutiny against Jon Snow. Jon Snow realized that the rest of the team did not see his vision. He decided to relinquish his duties of leadership and leave the Knights Watch altogether. He did not wish to lead a team that refused to change its ways and accept new information that could save their lives. Well, hello. Welcome to our episode titled Small Council Meeting. In this episode, Daenerys Stormborn, a.k.a. The Khaleesi, Jon Snow, a.k.a. King of the North, and Tyrion Lannister, a.k.a. Tyrion Lannister, must formulate a plan on how to create a meeting to speak with Tyrion's evil, ruthless sister, Cersei, about potentially forming a possible strategic alliance. There is a, a threat in the north. There is a army of the dead, AKA the Night Walkers, AKA the White Walkers, also known as just a big army of zombies that is coming down out of the snow to eat everybody, turn everyone else to zombies, and pretty much just kill everyone. All the key leaders from those regions realize that the only way to keep everyone from being eaten and turned into ruthless, crazy-looking zombies is to put aside all their differences, create some alliances, and come together as a team. The intent of this meeting is to get the evil Cersei to join forces with the key leaders of these regions. Cersei Cersei is a Lannister, and there's two things that the Lannisters have. They have gold, and they have soldiers. Um, Lannisters also always pay their debts. Fun fact, doesn't really have anything to do with small council meetings, but they do. 
Um, so if they can get Cersei on board and try to help out and create these alliances, they will have a lot better chance of defeating this zombie army that is coming in from the north. She will have to make an arrangement with Jon Snow and Daenerys. Daenerys has an army of Unsullied. The Unsullied are just a bunch of dudes that follow instructions really well and they kill everyone. Uh, and she also has a bunch of dragons. Bunch being three, still more dragons than everyone else. So that's that's pretty that's pretty cool. Uh, and they will she will use that part of her army to try to defeat the White Walkers. This alliance with Cersei, if she can, if her and John can convince Cersei to form one, will help them share some of the risk associated when trying to fight the Northern Army of the Dead. And then creating part of this strategic alliance is going to ultimately lead to globalization of the Seven Kingdoms. You have the key leaders of each one of these kingdoms. They are bringing in their resources. So you're going to start creating trade. You're going to start building alliances. You're going to start uh, bringing civilizations together. They're going to have to understand exactly you know, which way or how this civilization works how this group of people works, how the people of the North work, how the people of King's Landing at Cersei rules works. By bringing all these people together, they're going to essentially begin to globalize and unite to create one kingdom out of seven. Globalization is taking corporations from a global community, also the seven kingdoms, and bringing them together whether it be by trade of goods, technology, money, alliance, any of that stuff. Um, stated in Friedman's book, the world is flat. There are positive and negative effects of globalization. Anytime there is any competing firm, company, kings, rulers, competitors, you can cause harm and distrust to the locals. All these, to form this alliance, they have to be able to trust Cersei. Cersei has to be able to trust them. They have to be able to not have people that are used to being enemies now they need to trust each other and they need to work and fight together to fight this inevitable army of the north a major factor in trying to create a global community is the institutional environment an institutional environment to put it simply are the rules that operate within a country's boundaries these rules could be the different the rules of the different seven kingdoms you know, the, the people of the north that Jon Snow rules may have a different set of rules that they operate with than the Khaleesi's people, than the Unsullied operate with, than the people of King Land King's Landing that Cersei rules operate with. They all operate differently. They're all different complex societies will have different complex policies. Jon and Daenerys will have to try to figure out how to arrange this meeting without violating the institutional environment that has been set at King's Landing by Cersei. In the event that they arrive and potentially violate one of these rules or policies, it could ruin the chances of an alliance and potentially bring the Seven Kingdoms together. Uh, knowing a competitor's institutional environment is crucial. If they do not pay attention, the alliance cannot be created. Thus, the army of the dead zombies will come down, kill everybody, and that's the end of the story. So, hang on to your seats, pay attention, and enjoy the show. The Battle. In the episode of The Battle, Jon Snow successfully gets an army together to combine forces with Dyerians, Tyrion Lannisters, Sansa, and Ciri. Each of these leaders were leaders of their own region, coming together to form a regional management structure. This structure of management displays how each competitor is from a different region, but are willing to work together to achieve a common goal. However, even with their combined forces, they did not match the numbers wise in comparison to Ramsey's 5,000 man army. Jon Snow's objectives was to defeat Ramsey's army and kill Ramsey. Jon worked together with the other leaders and made strategic plans on how they can accomplish their goals. Jon Snow was also motivated to his troops and re Real made his army believe they would win this fight. This is a very important aspect for a manager to have 
because if you c can't get your team to try to achieve one common purpose, they don't really have a team at all. John had trouble before with his troops, but now he's adapted and became a leader, and this time he achieved motivating his troops. This plan making was basically made from the corporate level, because people like Jon Snow and Sansa were the leaders, and they made a decision. John then motivated his troops to go to battle and win this thing. Through John's perseverance and leadership, his army successfully defeated Ramsey. Welcome to the episode, Tyrion Councils. This episode is set in Daenerys' birthplace of Dragonstone. During this episode, Daenerys and Tyrion discuss the different types of leadership styles and how she needs to develop them as a leader. She has been sometimes known to be impulsive. He explained to her that to be an effective leader and a respected manager, she needs to try to improve on her conceptual skills. Conceptual skills are also known as cognitive complexity or her cognitive ability. Some of these skills are logical reasoning and judgment. The ability to think things through without acting impulsively. A leader or a manager that has good conceptual skills uh, may be able to effectively and logically work through certain issues to create solutions to many types of different complex problems. Cersei Lannister, the cruel and cold-hearted manager of the Iron Throne. To understand why Cersei is the way that she is and how she chooses to manage the Seven Kingdoms, you must first understand her struggles. As a mother, the greatest gift is the pure and innocent love you have for your children and their love for you. In this episode, The Lion and the Rose, Queen Cersei experiences the first of many losses, starting with her beloved son, King Joffrey. It is the day of his wedding to the pure and innocent Marjorie Tyrell. She sees Joffrey's evil side, but thinks that she can tame him enough to make it as his wife and help him manage the Iron Throne. She embraces his dark thoughts and shows him love and compassion. She introduces him to the people of King's Landing and shows him what it feels like to be charitable and give back to his people. Marjorie shows him what superior value can do for him. The service of helping and giving back to his people can produce a value for them worth more than what Joffrey's competitors for the Iron Throne can offer. If he can focus some of his energy on being a kind king to the people of Westeros, he can gain the supporters he needs to maintain his claim as the ultimate ruler slash manager. Superior value contributes to giving Joffrey that competitive advantage that he needs. To give some background of why Joffrey needed this competitive advantage, we must address the fatal death of Ned Stark, father of Arya and Sansa, who held the position as Hand of the King to his dear friend Robert Baratheon. As Robert lay on his deathbed, Ned Stark wrote the last words and requests of Robert, slightly altering the letter to state that Joffrey was not the heir to the Iron Throne. Ned Stark knew of Cersei's affair with her twin brother. Unfortunately, he was beheaded for this betrayal to the Lannisters, and this was considered an act of treason. It is important that Joffrey do everything in his power to maintain likeness to stay on the throne. Strategic vision can be defined as what the long-term view of the firm or kingdom will look like in the future. To reach this vision, the Lannisters agreed that Joffrey's engagement to a traitor's daughter, Sansa, wouldn't look good to the people. Sansa and Joffrey's engagement was called off, and Joffrey was to be wed to the Marjorie Tyrell of Highgarden. When Joffrey and Marjorie were married, Joffrey had his midget brother, or uncle Tyrion Lannister, wait on him and hand and foot. Tyrion was made out to be a fool, forced to fetch wine for his new king as the cupbearer. Tyrion would soon realize that he had been framed for the murder of King Joffrey. Joffrey requested Tyrion fetch him some wine, and it was then that the day took a fatal turn. Frothed at the mouth, he collapsed to the ground, pale-faced and spasming to his death. Cersei sprang out of her seat and ran over to her son. He died right there in her arms, and this is the first moment viewers feel the pain that Cersei Lannister felt. In the episode Mother's Mercy, Cersei Lannister is eager to see her beautiful, innocent, kind, and pure-hearted daughter, Marcella. She was shipped off to Dawn per Tyrion's request to test a theory and keep her safe. Tyrion thought it would be a good idea to send her to Dawn to secure the alliance between the already feuding houses. He thought Marcella would be safe if betrothed to a character known as Tristane. However, he was willingly giving them a hostage. It has been several years since she has seen her daughter, and Cersei trusts no other than her brother Jaime to sneak into Dawn and bring her home. Jaime is able to successfully go undercover and sneak into Dawn, but he is quickly discovered once inside. 
he's able to save the already worn thin alliance between the two houses and reluctantly is able to bring his daughter home. However, it is without conflict that this happens. Once on the ship sailing home to King's Landing, Marcella and Jamie finally have a moment alone and Jamie sees this opportunity to declare, to declare his love for his daughter. He is nervous to tell her that he is actually her biological father, but she stops him mid-sentence and tells him that she already knows and that she is happy that he is her father. They share a loving father-daughter moment and he finally gets to hold his daughter in his arms. This moment is brought to a halt when Marcella looks at her father with a troubled look and her nose starts to drip blood. Before Jamie can even realize that something is wrong, his daughter is taken away from him by the tight grip of poison. He is left to bring back the corpse of his lifeless daughter to Cersei. As benchmarking applies to a tool useful in assessing competitors, it is exactly what Cersei is faced with in this episode. After analyzing the firm's external environment, it could be forecasted that Queen Cersei would lose all three of her children, as the prophe prophecy stated. The environmental uncertainty of her enemies in Dawn made way for her daughter Marcella's death. When Cersei was just a young girl, she met a woman who practiced witchcraft, and she told her that she would bear three children and lose them all. In this episode, Winds of Winter, Cersei has finally gotten her revenge on the High Sparrow along with all of his little sparrows, the Faith Militant and Queen Marjorie. Cersei locked Tommen away in the Red Keep so that he would be safe from the explosion of the wildfire. As Tommen watches the Sept burst into nothing but a cloud of black smoke with his wife inside, he takes off his crown and takes his own life. Cersei promised all who wronged her that she would get rid of her revenge. Cersei's trial was to be held in the High Sept as one of her last steps to atone for her sins. This was Cersei's big moment to gather all of her enemies under the same roof and make her move. She had her guards keep Tommen from attending the trial. When Queen Marjorie finally realized that Cersei wasn't at her own trial and that it was a setup, it was too late for any of them to escape. Cersei annihilated every last enemy she had in King's Landing, leaving the throne open for her to protect against her fast approaching competitors. With the passing of his older brother Joffrey, Tommen is crowned the new king of the Seven Kingdoms in the episode first of his name. Most members of the kingdom are actually relieved of this switch because many felt as though he is much more virtuous than his psychotic brother and predecessor. Being a humble and compassionate king, Tommen is respected by his people immediately, showing his skill set is one that represents effective leadership. This is essential toward winning over his people as providing loyalty to his people will have them in turn be faithful and loyal to him. His youth indeed is questioned by members considering his vulnerability to being influenced by many around him, especially his mother. The next scene shows Tommen's mother Cersei talking with Marjorie as they watch Tommen be crowned. Although Marjorie is Joffrey's widow, Cersei recommends Marjorie be with Tommen while stating he will need help at the top of the throne and not considering herself as her son's helper. Marjorie is well aware that being married to Tommen would give her and her family an incredible competitive advantage over the other houses in the Seven Kingdoms. If Marjorie is successful in convincing Tommen to marry her, the Alliance will surely help her family become much stronger and more powerful. Marjorie then uses her skills in negotiation to win Tommen over and convince him to marry her specifically through seduction. She applies the acquired needs theory in order to win power and achievement within the Seven Kingdoms. She is extremely motivated in her risky attempt to try and convince Tommen to marry her in order for her to become queen once more. Although this is a risk for her, it is a moderate risk which she is willing to take in order to have the power that almost anyone born in a royalty family seems to want universally. There is a large amount of treachery and planning depicted in the episode Destruction of the Great Sept. Queen Marjorie shows her true loyalties to the House of Tyrell when being found guilty of lying for her brother Loras, who was facing trial for criminal charges. Queen Marjorie was lying on behalf of Loras in hopes that he would be found not guilty to charges brought up against him. The queen lying for her brother was all based on ideas she had been forming with her family's strategic plan. With this plan being put in place, she believed she would be the most powerful and popular queen ever using this power to provide superior value to her people. Believing her reign with King Tommen would be one that would have world would have never experienced before. If her brother was acquitted of the charges filed against him, he would remain the rightful heir to the High Guard of House Tyrell. With Queen Marjorie married to the King of the Iron Throne and her brother heir of High Guard, 
the family and House Tyrell would indeed form an incredible alliance which would give them enormous power in within the Seven Kingdoms. However, this strategic plan does not end up working out for the House Tyrell, as she is found lying. They both are held in contempt until Loras admits his guilt to the charges brought up upon him. Next scene shows Queen Marjorie with the High Sparrow, Loras, and a number of other people awaiting trial, and for Cersei, who is nowhere to be found. Queen Marjorie suddenly realizes that with Cersei's absence, that everyone in the Great Sep was in great danger. She quickly advises the High Sparrow everyone needs to leave and that the trial can be pushed to another time. Cersei has formed her own ideas towards what needs to happen for the success of her house to flourish. These ideas are shown in this episode in the form of tactical planning, where Cersei understands the importance to eliminate members who have the power to overthrow her. She has the Great Set blown up, with everyone who is set to oppose her during the trial, abolishing many rivals as well as nearly everyone in the House Tyrell. She also makes sure to have her last child, Tommen, kept at the Red Keep, where he would be safe and keep her house purity safe. Tommen watches the Great Sep destroyed and is crushed when realizing his wife as well as numerous innocent people have been killed in the process. He questions the managerial ethics of this decision his mother made, as it certainly was an inhumane way of handling the situation. Shortly after the Great Sept explodes, Tommen finds it unbearable to think of life without his wife and cannot live with the knowledge that, that so many innocent people died at the hands of his mother's plans, ultimately taking his own life. In the episode Trial, the Lady of Winterfell, the newly crowned ruler Sansa Stark, wisely uses a rational model in her decision on the fate of Peter. Peter Balish, also known as Littlefinger, was once a mentor to Sansa, and taught her many things that have made her the successful ruler she has become. But these lessons show their hidden meaning when Sansa reveals that she discovered that Peter convinced Liza Aaron to kill her husband John and write a letter convincing the Starks that it was Lannister's doing. She goes on to say that after this plan unfolded, Peter killed Liza in order to cover his tracks. Sansa shows no ethical dilemma as Peter defends his innocence, despite Bran revealing that he has seen Peter's crimes in a vision. Sansa then shows no remorse as she sentences Peter to death. This shows Sansa showing strength as a leader and how she has grown because she didn't let her and Peter's past cloud her decision-making process, and she did what she knew had to be done. Management is a dynamic process. It is ever-evolving and changing with the times. However, there are certain aspects of management that may never change. Some things that may not change are how to deal with people or how to motivate and influence others. The term manager means you will always have to deal with subordinates. Being able to deal with and lead subordinates is a key role in a manager's scope of practice. However, with continual changing technology and globalization becoming more and more a part of every business capability, Managers are going to need to be able to adapt and overcome the challenges that come with these dynamic processes. Conferences are moving away from meeting rooms and moving into the digital ward. Documents are able to be shared in real time all over the world, and depending on the company, managers may not even work in the same facility as their employees. With globalization becoming so prevalent, managers may have to learn different cultures, customs, and international relations. Managers now, more than ever, will have to learn to think outside the box, maintain a flexible mindset, and adjust at a moment's notice.